Meet Magic. The Meet Magic meetings compared to the other meetings that we have, I have thousands of meetings, literally. And at the end of a 45-minute meeting, I've helped sick kids at the Starlight Children's Hospital, which is my chosen charity. When you're first meeting someone, you're trying to build a connection. And with Meetings for Good, you just find the connections automatically there. And when I actually think about what Meet Magic does and the opportunity to spend some time supporting the community of our vendors, but also being able to give back. And when the opportunity presented itself to join Meet Magic, I jumped at it. But these ones are different. And the reason they're different is because the vendor wants to meet with you and they're willing to put their money where their mouth is. All of those meetings blur into one, but meeting for good is memorable. It absolutely makes sense to, to do this, and I definitely recommend peers to, to engage with that magic. How good is that? Now, all of the meetings blur into one, but meeting for good. You know, Paul Keane, Sean Miller, Dave Cowan, Andrew Webster, Big blessings. Um, we love you for all the support that you've been giving us and for helping me create that video because that is absolutely beautiful. Now it's Friday, far out, Poets Day. Um, we've got an amazing guest on today, Ed, Ed Trick. He's the co-founder of a company called Tea Time. And he's also the CFO of a, a tech company called pay.com.au. So for those that don't know me, um, I was raised with... Well, actually, in multiple council houses in the UK in the 70s. In fact, I, sa I say to this, and if you were born in the 70s, you were literally born in the, in the late 1900s. Let that sink in for a minute. So I was born in the late, mid to late 19, 1900s, raised with a Jamaican family. I was the only white kid in my family, which is great. So I can speak Jamaican and cook Jamaican and all that sort of stuff. I left school at 15, left home at 16, don't have a single qualification to my name. And I'm the founder of a purpose led platform as a service called Meet Magic. And this platform basically is a way for executives like Ed to, to get an opportunity to give back doing what they do every single day at work, which is meetings. So we are redefining what a meeting is. Now, the purpose of this podcast is really to showcase leaders and change makers in, and show that, showcase their story because like me, they've all got one. And this podcast, podcast theme is all about them, who inspired them growing up. It's not about their their day job as such, but it's more about their mentors and their vision of the future, and more importantly, how they give back now. So if you're a leader and you want to be on my show, well, I'll put I'll put a link in the podcast. In fact, Jimmy, the, the other co-founder of, of uh, if you're listening, Jimmy, give us a smile, mate. If Jimmy's listening, Jimmy created this thing called the Magic Mind Card, and it's, it's a bit of a test. Um, it's really a way to prove to yourself that you're actually a purpose-led leader and not just talking about it but actually want to do it so there's a there's a test there do the test if you pass a test you can come on the show but for now let me just introduce ed hello mate hey carl how are we did you not my was that okay it was perfect there were you know i wouldn't have put it any uh any better myself it was brilliant mate, I, I, i'm literally winging it <laughs> you're doing a great job and i'm glad you've uh Thank you, given Jimmy a shout out. The guy uh, is incredible, and he, you know, deserves all the accolades that he's getting. So, you know, good on him. Yeah, I was talking to my missus this morning, and I said, "Could you imagine if Jimmy and I were working full time together? It'd be, it'd be, it'd be, it'd be mad because we're both high energy, ADHD, mental brains. And when Jimmy and I get on the phone talking, we just like." <laughs> I can only imagine because, um, you know, when you speak to Jimmy on the phone, you know, you know that 90 percent of the words are coming from his direction. Um, yeah. but, uh, yeah. it's, it's a great experience, nevertheless. And, and you know, we speak every day, so I'm, I'm well acquainted. But you know the best thing about Jimmy? Every time I, I leave the call with Jimmy, I'm always feeling higher than when I got on it. That is really powerful. I've had a couple of people say to me recently that every time they've had a meeting with me, they've left and they've been buzzing or like feeling a little bit elevated and lifted up. And I get that same thing with Jimmy is it, it, it's just that energy that's it's positive, it's hyper positive. And so you've got no choice. If your energy is feeling a bit low and, you know, you get on a call with Jimmy for five minutes, you've got, you've got no choice but to get your shit together and, and wake up. <laughs> <laughs> oh look completely and you know what? i actually think it's a um 
it's an undervalued skill in providing energy, um, whether it's in your workplace, your personal life. Um, if you've got positive energy, people will be drawn towards you, uh, gravitate naturally towards you. And the one thing about Jimmy is people will call him when they're when they're down. And actually, we've had you know some conversations in the background. He's one of these people that you call to lift you up. You call when you're down. And you say, "Hey, yeah, you know, I, I, um, you know, I need to suck some of that energy and put it into myself." And you know, there's no one better at it, I believe. Now it's all about you though. This one, this call. So you cool. sound, you sound, you sound very English like me. I don't know if you came from a council house like me, but um, this is really is about about Ed and where Ed came from and what got you here. As, as I mean, you're you're not even a COO. That's a that's a typo. I'm gonna change that because you're you're actually a CFO. I'm, so I'm in the numbers, Carl. You know, spreadsheets <laughs> and then transferring those spreadsheets to PowerPoints. That's my game. And, uh, uh, you know, making people um, who are perhaps not fully number literate understand um, understand their purpose in the organization uh, with a numbers uh, intent. It's very, and honestly, without numbers, you, you, if you don't know the numbers, you're, you're crazy in, in business. It's really important. But as a CFO, I, I was. As I'm sat here, my brain's going over there because uh, that's what it does. And there's a guy called Serge Radzik, one of our clients, works for a company called Minerva. And I, I put him in touch with a guy, a friend of mine called Sean O'Donoghue, who's a CFO of Cuscal this morning. Now, CFO, Sean's a bit, a bit of a boomer, been around a long time. Is he's, he's the CFO of a big payments company, and he's still doing stuff on spreadsheets way too much. Now... Serge's business is getting rid of spreadsheets and Sean's like got this revelation going, holy shit, I didn't know you could actually do that. I'm going to, I don't know if you can do what he does. I can't explain what, what Serge does, but I'm going to connect him with you and a company called Minerva. Just if he can help you get rid of spreadsheets and keep doing stuff, it's yeah, eliminating your spreadsheets. But tell us, tell us a little bit about you, Ed. Tell us who you are, who you work for and how the hell you got here as a CFO. Oh, well, um, well, let, actually, let's just start on that spreadsheet uh, comment, um, because, look, absolutely, I think, uh, you know, the, in 10, 20 years time, Microsoft Excel won't, it won't be in the format that it's in right now. Uh, mm -hmm. And ultimately, you know, you've got to build all these, um, build all these skill sets in terms of financial modeling um, and, you know, transferring them into kind of legible formats for, you know, anybody board, re board reporting to understand. And, yeah, you know, on the, on the subject you mentioned there, I think the way that it's going is yeah. Look, spreadsheets will not um, will be there, but there'll be AI generated where you can effectively plug business assumptions into a, uh, a system, and it spits out actually the same outputs that the uh, the the model that you spent the last four weeks building with all the uh, fifteen tabs um, and you know, extreme formulas. I reckon that that's probably the, the way that I can see it going. And I've seen lots of great systems at the moment where you just plug your zero and accounting system, and it will mm. auto um, calculate and auto forecast based on your growth and trajectory. So, look, I think that um, that's where it's going is my view. But look, just to if you circle back, you know, who am I? Where um, you know where have I come from? So look, absolutely from the UK. I'm from a town called Aylesbury in Buckinghamshire, and um, look, I look, I didn't grow up in uh, a council house. I grew up in suburbia um, in a um, we call them in the UK estates. So it was a um, one of those '90s brick built houses uh, that would almost be a replica of about. 500 others uh, in, in, a, in a quite a small area, um, but look, I had a I had a great childhood. Um, you know, I had a, a loving family. Everything um, you know within reason um, provided for me. The one thing I didn't ever have to worry about was food on the table, and I feel very fortunate um, mm. for that. Um, however, in the same respect, I went through a lot of hardships, like like everyone did. Um, my you know father died when I was eight. Um, my other father figure, my granddad, um, died when I was, I want to say, 14. And look, by the time I was 15, I think I'd had uh, attended more funerals for family members than I'd had birthdays. Um, and so that sort of, you don't realise what impact that has until you get a little older. Um, and you realise, hey, actually, there's there's my my mum, who's bringing up myself and my brother, um, and she was a nursery nurse or an educator, um, as a Australians um, call them. And, you know, she doesn't have a wealth of contact. So, you know, as you get older, you realise 
oh god, I'm just making I'm I, I'm making this path for myself that I have no idea about. Um, and yeah, look, yeah, yeah, I think um, everybody has a story, and everybody is you know pulled back or or placed forward in in some way. I, um, but for me, it was um, you know that those role models that I had as a as a child, particularly male role models, were taken away from me very young, and then you get this inner you get this inner um, motivation to say, well, I'm just going to do this myself. I don't need anybody else. I'm going to work out the pathway for myself. And, you know, as I got into my 20s and then now in my 30s, um, I think you, 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 you realise so much more about yourself and, and, and where you want to go. Um, yeah. So, yeah, look, I've in terms of career-wise, um, I did all sorts of jobs growing up right from stacking prawns at Iceland. I don't know if you remember the supermarket. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. I did that for several years and through uh, um, some holidays at university, I then worked uh, in, in, a, in call centers and did a whole host of, um, of, of jobs. But then my first you know, proper job, I would say, was I worked for a bank, um, Lloyds Bank, in the... Oh, yeah. In the UK, and I spent seven or eight years working through their, um, you know, private equity division. I worked in their um, commercial finance teams, worked in their corporate affairs team, looking at their PR, and did several um, several stints through Lloyd's. Um, and then, and then, look, my my wife and I, who's a who's a Kiwi, decided we'd uproot and come uh, to Melbourne. Um, and then, you know, from being in Melbourne, I've uh, I yeah, managed to cement myself in uh, a role within aged care initially in, in, in NDIS, um, worked up to be the uh, CFO at a, um, at a company called Careabout, which looks to find aged care solutions for individuals navigating the aged care space. So if your mum needs a home care provider, hey, go to Careabout, they'll find you a, find you a provider. Um, and then through my contacts uh, and the chairman of that business, a guy called Damian Waller, who's the uh, was the co-founder of iSelect um, and is also the chair of pay.com.au. I then moved uh, and, and are now um, full time at um, pay.com.au, managing all their finance numbers, data analytics. Uh, a CFO isn't what it used to be, Kyle. It's uh, no. it's it's completely changed. Well, I mean, my the only CFO I know is Sean O'Donoghue, who's the CFO of Cusco. He's um, he's a beer monster. I mean, I, I've had I, I, our kids swam together. That's how we know each other. Um, I, I, I mean, he's an, he's an, an amazing. His brain is just like next level stuff. I mean, I I've had him do stuff for me that I don't know how he's done it. Um, we were drinking together. Our kids went to Germany uh, for a swimming competition. In their, te- in their early teens, they're like 12, 13, and we were in, but, but went to, to Berlin. But Sean and I decided to go to Munich because the beer festival was on. And I don't think I'd be here if Sean didn't save me. Apparently, after about eight or nine of those steins, I, w- I was trying to pay for the taxi with my hotel room key, and uh, the taxi driver wanted to get me arrested or something. I, I I don't remember, but I ended up on the plane and we got back to back to Berlin somehow that night after. I don't know. He was like sober after like eight steins. I don't know how he does it, but I was just a, a complete mess. But as, as a CFO, he's probably one of the top in the country. I think he's floating a company at the moment as well. So I think the CFO's role is really is everything, right? He So he, you you probably remember the 86400 app, the phone? Um, the uh, app no, the- I don't think I do. So 86400 is now the U-Bank card the, 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 on, on the, di- the digital banking. Yeah. He basically raised the money for that, got that started, and then sold it to NAB, and now it's U-Bank and whatever. So I think the CFO's role was really is everything. It's not just about spreadsheets. Absolutely not at all. But um, no. So, your, yes. so your, mentors, your mentors growing up, I mean, you, you mentioned you've lost two of those early ones, two of those father figure mentors fairly early on in your life. What? What about other ones? Where did you get them from, as mother? Um, look, I, I wouldn't. Um, I think mentor is an interesting word. I potentially, not like you know, outside of when I started in working, you know, uh, probably at Lloyd's, there weren't really any mentors. Um, 
other than my, my uncle, who I very much look up to and, and, and have all my life. So my uncle, um, he actually worked in uh, a stint in banking for a company called uh, Standard Chartered. Um, and, then, and, then he, yeah, and then he went on to start his own car garage, uh, selling, um, effectively selling uh, high-end used cars. And it's that entrepreneurial journey um, that really inspired me. And I think, you know, when you see someone start something from nothing, it's merely a vision. It's an idea. It's a philosophy at, at the time. And you see that vision come to come to fruition and you see that vision even grow and change and evolve right from where they started. And, um, you know, the vision of uh, someone even starting a what is a you know, a bricks and mortar, you know, a, a business you see every day and you think, well, how can there be any more vision other than just selling more cars? There's actually a lot more to it than that. It's it's selling yeah. more cars, selling different types of cars, opening a service garage. Uh, it, it, it actually, it's quite mind blowing, even in certain mm. smaller industries that you think are, you know, what, what could be the vision or, or um, you know, behind behind that. So look, certainly my uncle was a, um, was a significant influence. It sounds like you've, I mean, uh, our experiences of what define us as growing up, definitely. I mean, I, I, I've i got a, a poor man's mindset because my first memory was sleeping in the back of, my, back of my dad's truck with a with his coat over me. And I, at that point in time, I said, I'm homeless and I'm poor. And that, that still stays with you. Uh, I can imagine losing your parents uh, at an early age and losing, or losing a, a sibling or a parent at an early age has a massive impact on you. But you then went on and, and then ended up working in the aged care factory which is and i want to come on to the obviously tea time in a minute but that that would have obviously influenced the, the beginning of tea time as well i imagine oh I, yeah look, absolutely that's where i met um jimmy and uh ultimately we had a we had a moment um at an aged care uh facility in well blue cross ashby uh while we whilst we were working at care about and that was where the you know the idea stemmed from um yeah. and Look, that was a uh, a moment where we were sitting down talking to a uh, a resident, and she then um, said, "Oh, my son-in-law's the number one tennis player in Australia." And you know, Jimmy and I we'd, we'd already uh, you know been to I want to say over a hundred residential aged care facilities and, and, and visiting, and so you look at each other like, "Oh, okay, well." Is, it, is this actually true or is this another yarn or another story? Um, but then, no, look, she said, oh, look, no, actually, my, um, his name's Glenn Busby. And so Jimmy whipped out his, his Samsung Fold at the time. Uh, you know, I always used to um, take the mic being brick. Um, but then he Googled Glenn Busby. And, no, you know, there he was winning the heats in Miami. Um, and lo and behold, he was the over 60s number one tennis player at the time. Mm -hmm in the world so she was telling the truth but then what that moment then evolved uh you know evolved from there was actually the whole place lit up with emotion and so you know the the, the resident was saying no, no, no look, see i told you i told you and everyone came and gathered and the whole place lit up and it was that moment that then inspired actually if we could do if we could provide this moment um you know for tens of millions of people in care settings across the globe then you know what could happen um and then from there uh yeah the idea um was born and um look it's it's been it's been um you know going ever since and going it's strong a, it's a anyway, when when jimmy talks to me about what you guys are doing and i i, I take a step back and i just I sort of take myself out of the emotion because i know you know family and emotion and all that it's, it's it's huge when you think about the feeling that you get from connection that's that's a big thing i look at at a practical level, let's talk about finance for a minute. I know friends like Neil Brookhausen, who's one of the founders of Ironbridge Capital, a big private equity company. They own all sorts of different stuff. One of the key investments for them is aged care. They've invested in so many of these things up and down the country because obviously it's a growing industry. It's never going to be going away. But no one's ever actually looked at the, the health or the mental health or the the, the, the quality of that of the, of the people from these connections in there from a technology perspective and I, th I think in our in our heads we all go um oh you've got Facebook or you've got some sort of social media that you can use but it's just not about that and I, I remember when Jimmy was telling me about tea time and he, he told me the story he said look 
imagine you're 80 or 90, you're on your last chapter of, of your life and you're in an aged care facility. You've got a, a grandkid in the UK that's running the 100 meters and they've just run it and there's a video there. Imagine if you could actually get that video, send it to the person inside the aged care facility in Australia and they could actually reply and be a part of that journey and feel like they're, they're, they're connected to their family, what that does for that person in that, in that facility from a mental perspective. It, it's massively uplifting. That for me almost, it, it, it's giving me goose pimples now, but t- tell us the stories that you're hearing because that sort of thing for me is, that's the, that's the root of why it should be a global phenomenon in every aged care facility because everybody wants that connection. Yeah, um, and look, absolutely. I think look, that goes to you know, describe what the problem is at the moment. And the problem is almost cyclical where there's this element of disconnect where um, families are feeling you know, guilty about putting their loved ones in care for the right reasons. They're feeling guilty about taking an individual uh, outside of their community, outside of their comfort zone, you know, away from their families and putting them into a new community that's, that's an unknown. Um, and then that, you know, can lead to a lot of mis, you know, representation where, you know, the care sector is under such scrutiny. So I'll give you the parallels that I'm working in the moment. So I'm working, um, you know, pay.com.eu is a hugely, you know, successful, fast growing payments business where the risks associated with that are more with things like fraud. And, um, you know, you can put dollar value on any, any, mis- call them mistakes, call them um them gaps uh and whereas in, in care you're working in a completely different you know it's a human aspect and there's no mm-hmm. dollar values on this it's if you make a mistake and you know the the carers slip up with their humans then there is a the the retribution is astronomical in terms of you'll have the media turning up at the doorstep of the aged care facility straight away you'll have families up in arms um and so what's happening is there's this disconnection of people going in, and that leads on to the misrepresentation of the, the, the sector as a, as a whole, um, because people are fearful of um, you know, presenting anything that's going on in these care settings and pushing it out to the, the public because they're fearful of being misrepresented and, and then having the media turn up and saying, you know, what's going on here? Um, and then finally, that's leading to the burnout and the exhaustion of the workforce, the workforce feeling undervalued. Um, and so what the whole premise or the problem that we're trying to solve is we're, we're cutting the disconnection. We're opening the doors to the, the aged care sector in particular and saying, hey, all your assumptions are wrong. Everything you've read in the media is about the 1%, not the 99%. Look at this. Look at who we're working with. Look at these progressive providers who are making a difference to the sector. And just, you know, just before I forget, I just want to shout out those uh, providers, because I really believe these, these are the best providers in Australia who are, you know, really spearheading the change. And, um, you know, one of them is Medical Age Care Group, Samantha Freeman, um, Cameron McPherson, who are leading the charge with um, changing the perception of aged care. Um, Accent Home Care, Eva Sima and Lisa Carsten, Ality, Blue Cross, Damien Hutchinson, all the, uh, the crew across these brands are really looking to make change. And with Tea Time, what we're doing is we're opening the doors that were previously bolted shut uh, in fit. And we're opening the door and saying, hey, this is actually what's happening. This is actually where mum is. This is actually what mum's doing. And hey, mum, here's a video of all your family showing what they're up to. They're off getting married. Um, and, you know, there's an exact story that's come up recently that, you know, Jimmy's been surveying across, I think he's done about 50 or 60 with one of our uh, homes. Is he's found there is a, uh, a lady whose son is in Scotland. And his ash ashes, he's just, uh, he's unfortunately died. His ashes are about to get scattered um, over one of the peninsulas in, in Scotland. And that moment's going to be filmed. And that moment is going to be passed back to the uh, aged care facility through tea time. And then that's going to be shown to the whole care community as a, as a sign of respect um, and as a sign of closure for that resident. And that is something that is, is more... Uh, you know, more impact emotionally than anyone can ever think or understand. And that's what we're doing. It's all about emotional impact. And instead of thinking all about the clinical side, which is hugely important, it's about the emotional aspects and how people are feeling and feeling that sense of belonging and connection. 
I think there's something else also. When I sit here thinking about what you're doing, and I've not really thought too much about this, um, but, you know, I'm, I'm, my chief evangelist is Rory Sutherland. He's the vice chairman of Ogilvy in the UK. I mean, he's probably the number one advertising man on the planet. But he's also the behavioral science practice founder of Ogilvy as well. So he talks a lot about um, the, the things that you don't necessarily see, but you know it's it's almost like the the unspoken the, or the it, it's the it, it's it's the things that you know are true, but you don't That's necessarily funny. know until you see it. And, and it's often when you see it, you go ah yes, but you actually don't realize it straight away. And it, one of the things that's just occurred to me is you're actually making people feel like they're winning at work. And when you feel like you're winning at work, everything lifts up. And I, I, the example is we're sort of going through this at the moment with, with what we do and how we position this with Meet Magic and the impact that these meetings have for the execs because the meetings, they, they come away from a meeting, they've, they, they know that that meeting is going to support a particular charity, they're going to feel great about that, they're more engaged at work, they're more productive at work, they're, they're a better leader, better husband, partner, whatever. And then so all of a sudden everything lifts up. But from a sales perspective, just having a conversation with someone that's prepared to listen makes you feel like you're winning. And that actually helps you make you perform a lot better. And I just sat here and thought the same thing about those poor care workers who are just all they want to do is actually make those people feel better inside their inside the, the facility. I shouldn't call it a facility. It sounds like a mental hospital. I should call it, what, call it an age, what do you call it? Age, home. Age, home. Age, home. Um, it's crazy. Huh? Words. Words mean so much, right? But the point is you're creating these little bits of psychological magic which really are helping people feel like they're winning. And that, I can't help but think that's going to attract people to want to work in those, in those homes and what, rather than the whole negative stuff that's been around about how people have been treated and whatever else. Are, are you starting to see anything like that? Because that sort of clinical, you can get some clinical evidence built up around that, surely. Hmm. Well, so, look, you know, Jimmy is on the ground day to day uh, within the homes and he's doing a great job of, dispelling and um you know play, putting out stories so you know if for anybody listening you should be following him, him on uh linkedin his stories are amazing and yeah. what it's doing is creating a, a you can almost feel it there's a groundswell of people looking at that and feeling um, you know they want to be a part of it and at the moment you know aged care the care sector in general you know i'm talking ndis child care every, the whole combined there's a real stigma you know, as in sometimes people are if you ask what do you do and someone says i'm an aged care worker it sometimes it, 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 with many people they they feel embarrassed um yep. because of the negative press that they just constantly receive and mm. we know having you know visited hundreds of homes that this is absolutely not the case we need to be shouting about these people we need to be providing inspiration for people to work in this environment and we need to also project those real stories and um and provide the inspiration and for younger people to actually want to work in that environment because at the moment let's be honest no australians and no uh british born people as well talking from respect want to work or feel motivated to work in that environment and we have to seek it's like 90 to 98 percent overseas workers who are filling these roles but why is that we're not we're, no one's looking at the why yes of course the pay we believe they're underpaid, absolutely. But why else? It's because there's, 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 um, yeah, there's, there's no positives uh, attached to being in that environment. Um, we're not pushing positive enough positive stories about the reality of that environment. So, you know, we're here to change that, and we're, we're going to. It's really interesting. It, 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 it literally is a perception thing, right? I think we. We, we don't necessarily value things. We, we value their meaning. And I, and I think things are actually determined by the laws of physics. You know, you get a car or a house or it's physics. But but what, what they actually mean are determined by the laws of psychology. And psychology is what you're doing here. You're, you're playing a game where the perception of, of a feeling inside a home should be good all the time. 
because of what you're doing. And I, if any, if any home or, or, or aged care facility is not looking at digital transformation and using technology as a role to, to enable social impact like you guys are doing, what are you seeing as the barriers for them adopting it? Is it because it, I see a lot of charities, and I'm, I'm going to shout. I'm, I'm just going to call bullshit sometimes because I see a lot of charities going, "Oh, we've got no money," and then when you give them an opportunity to actually use their, bring their partners to get money, they they, they don't do anything because because this is the this is the ludicrous thing. They always do what they've always done because it's safe, and they always do what their competitors are doing because it's the best way to not to not get fired. And if you do something that's new. It might it might not work and you might get fired. So let's not do it. It's too risky. Are you seeing anything like that playing out? Because I, you know, you, we can see all these problems in aged care and, and homes. But if the technology exists and they're not adopting it, why? What is the, what are the barriers that you're seeing? Um, look, in the care sector, uh, there are leaders and there are followers, um, and we're working with the leaders right now. Mm. Um, and we very much anticipate that the followers will come once the once they see and they are seeing the impact that embedding this technology has on not only their residents but their staff and also their their current families and potential families yep. that they're look, they'll be engaging all in the future. Now, the key barrier I would say is isn't necessarily dollars, isn't necessarily money. Um, whilst do bear in mind that two thirds of aged care homes uh, from the last day were, were losing money, um, mm -hmm. it's actually more about uh, the time investment and the prioritization of an initiative that is solely based on emotional well being. So, you know, there is a lot, and rightly so, and I'm not, you know, distracting mm -hmm. from this, but there is the vast majority is clinical focus when you move into um, aged care. It's, it's clinical. What, what's your diagnosis and how do we help with that? But there isn't a real focus on, hey, actually, there has been some trauma here, some emotional trauma with moving from my community, my family that I have lived and grown up with for years and years and years, and now in a new community at, at a very, you know, at a reasonable age to say, hey, I'm being placed in this new environment. Um, Where's my support? My, where's my emotional support? And the staff do such an amazing job that they become their friends, they become their family, but there is very little at the moment to assist with that, building the relationship with the staff uh, and uh, the residents. And then bringing the family into the care environment, even when the family are in, you know, all across the world in another uh, you know another destination all across australia we know that the world is international these days and it's not because the families or the friends don't want to be involved or don't care it's because they're living their own life you know i've got a little daughter my mum's in the the uk if she was in a, a home you know i'd be one of those those sons that couldn't visit her um you know very i can visit more than once a year so it's not a case of pointing fingers who's responsible for what. It's, it's just saying, hey, let's actually focus more on the emotional impact of you know, the mm. distress and the, um, the destabilization of emotions when moving into that environment. And let's provide a tool that helps bridge that and build the relationship. So, you know, that's the core of it. Um, and then, look, you know, there'll always be blockers to everything, Carl. And what you have to do is prove it and work with the best of the best um, and get them to showcase what impact it's having. And once you, you showcase it with, with the top providers, the care providers and the ones that are forward thinking, it, it, it becomes inevitable that everyone else has to jump on board. I, I actually don't think that reality is a particularly good guide for human happiness. I, 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 I know that. I think the circumstances of our lives actually matter less to our happiness than the sense of control that we feel over our lives. And I, I think that control is really important. I, I'm 54 next month and, you know, I've spent all my money building a platform. I've got nothing left. I mean, I'm literally, my bank account's pretty much empty and I give it all away. And, 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 you know, I'm spending it on my daughter. She's, I've got a son in the UK, I got a daughter here at uni. So all the money goes to the kids. And I'm investing, and you're probably going to do the same. I'm investing all of this money into my daughter's um, on the hope 
that she'll put me in a nice home. And I would literally hope that I get a decent experience when I go into a nice home. And I'm sitting here thinking to myself, how do you make sure that you get a good experience if they're all shit right now? Um, how do you how do you ensure that by the time I get there in 30 years' time, um, that all this technology and this feeling that I've got right now of being connected is still there? So for me, I I, I think this human happiness needs to start right now. I think, do you think that you you should start targeting people my age in their 50s? Because you're going to get there eventually. Um, and maybe that is a great way to start driving the adoption and getting these people to start thinking a little bit differently about how they're adopting these technologies because they, they're going to get left behind, surely. I mean, it's you could almost become the leaders in healthcare by adopting technologies like this and increasing and raising everybody's happiness and the feeling and emotional well-being. Look, I think it's um, look, I, I completely don't disagree that uh, you know targeting a the pre-boomer audience, I guess, uh, Generation X, is it? Um, yeah, is is one way <laughs> is is one way to to go about it. But really, what the goal is is to act on the Royal Commission's recommendation for transparency, and the blueprint is there for you know tea time and all other. Uh, technology, um, you know, technology businesses to to make a social impact in in the care sector. The blueprint is there for change. It's about who is willing to to go first. Who's willing to really be progressive and and and, and you know you have to find those people. It takes a it, it takes a while. We have found them, um, but you know once we open the doors, those doors will never shut again. And actually, the stories that will come out, um, the people that will be presented and showcased, uh, you know, they're going to feel significantly better about themselves and they're going to feel like they're part of something. They're part of something bigger. Um, so, look, we couldn't be more proud. Um, and, yeah, it, it's, it's, it's happening. And, um, you know, watch this space for sure. I, if there's anything I can do to help help you grow, and I, I know I've connected you guys with Bupa, and I, I know that conversation is progressing really well. And, you know, if there's anything I can do to help, I, I think I often think that there's there's a permafrost layer of business leaders in there that are stopping innovation from happening. And these some of these, I think when you start thinking about the reasons why that, that they're stopping that, I think it's much easier for them to be fired for being illogical than it is for being unimaginative. And, and the fatal issue with logic, of course, is that it always gets you to exactly the same place as your competitors. So that is why nothing changes, because they're all just doing the same thing to stop themselves from being fired, where in actual fact, if you allow innovation to occur, um, everybody would be much much better off. It, it, it's, it's, it's human behavior and logic. And I, the human mind, it, it doesn't run on logic any more than a horse runs on petrol. And I... I just can't help but think there's that there's a massive opportunity here for you guys to really transform people's lives and to use technology to really make a, so, a massive social impact. It really is. And it's just a matter of time, I think. Get get past that permafrost layer. Uh, and I think you start to look at the whole reasons behind um, those that are, are holding it back and understand what is – I mean, in order to get to good answers, you've got to ask really dumb questions sometimes. And maybe it's – a the level of questioning that we need to improve and get a bit more you need to come to, to come to a logical question you got to ask ask a dumb a dumb a dumb, a dumb one so i think yeah there's a lot of a lot of opportunity there i think um let me just give a quick shout out why you've done that as well because i know I'm, I'm talking about i've got a i've got a one o'clock another one o'clock podcast after this that i've got to go so i want to come to these five questions with you in a minute, Ed. Um, the five little Socratic questions. I had to Google what Socratic mean, meant because I had no idea. But um, there's just short little two two questions which I want to get some answers to. But I want to give a shout out to to to, to Dane and the team at my site, my CISO, my CISO. I'm a, I'm English, my CISO. Um, these guys have built an app that's helping small to medium companies with their security management. So if you've got all that compliance and stuff that you got to deal with, and everybody has to deal with that today. And you don't have a CISO, you don't have all the that, that massive support team of a cybersecurity team. Their app gives you access to all of that information and compliance, SOC stuff, and everything else. So, 
big shout out to Dane and the team. Um, I, I, I just love the fact that, like you, Dane's innovating. Another good English lad is a bit of an Arsenal fan as well, so he's a gooner. Um, oh, so dear, I dear. Shocking. I mean, I, Dane, turn it up, son. Um, but he's, he's, he's an amazing human being as well, trying, trying his best to get this off the ground and helping people. So big shout out to Dane. Now, th 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 these questions, because they, they really are very, very simple. And they're, let me find them here. Now, you've got to come up pretty quickly, right? So it's one or the other. What time? What, what time do you have dinner? 5.30. Right. How long does it take you to get ready? 15, 20 minutes. Oh, that's pretty good. Do you respect Kanye West? Yeah, absolutely. Oh. As in, uh, yeah, I think you, you've, always, you've got to have a level of respect for anyone that's got to a pinnacle of a career like that, whether you agree or disagree with what the, you know, the other uh, segment of what he's saying, um, which is, you know, divisive then uh, we've yeah. got to respect people for, for, for getting where they are i'm not there i mean we're not there so all respect i think i think he just calls out what everyone what, what he knows that everybody else knows but they're not prepared to say i think is yeah i'm just i'm with that i know you mentioned your your wife's a kiwi which part of new zealand are you from cambridge north island all oh, right um well say something in an asian language Konnichiwa. <laughs> uh, does that win? Does that win? I don't, I'm not sure. Yeah. I have no idea. Well, you've stumped me there. That'll do, Ed. I'm, I'm talking or chocolate, or talking or texting is, a, is the last one. Oh, talking. Yeah. I, know, I, I think I talk too much sometimes, mate. Um, but look, I just want to say thank you for coming on. Good luck with the tea time and stuff. Is there, if there's anything I can do to help push this thing along and help you get anywhere. Um, I reckon there's a great conversation for some of the private equity companies. You've, you've got a finance background. Um, you, I can, I'm, I'm more than happy to connect you with those, the guys over at um, Iron Bridge, because they're invested in a whole, whole lot of homes. And you know, I think if you can transfer, what you do for them, you help them transform their business, which helps them get more people coming in the door, which helps them grow their revenues. Isn't that what they're all about? I uh, think so. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that why you've invested? Hello. So it's a bit of a no-brainer, I think. So if there's anything I can do to help, um, keep going and keep doing all that good stuff, though, Ed. And say say hello to the team over at pay.com. I actually tried to understand how we could leverage it at Meet Magic as well. And I, I just couldn't work it out how to do it. So maybe get one of the guys to get a hold of us. Well, 100%. So, I mean, look, in terms of uh, if anyone's watching that's a business owner and wants to uh, earn about five times, six times the amount of, uh, you know, frequent flyer points than they can possibly earn uh, using their American Express or any other means, then look, check out um, pay.com.au. They've really innovated and um, changed the whole payments landscapes with how people are rewarded for payments. Um, and, you know, in terms of what they've done in a short space of time, it's actually, it's, it's actually incredible. Did you just say five times? If you use your Amex for your, you know, daily spend, let's say your you can use them for what, fifteen percent of your payments. Well, pay.com.au can extrapolate that to almost, you know, nearly a hundred percent of all your payments. So you could be earning points on almost, and I'm talking payroll. We're talking your your tax, bas payments. Um, you know, we facilitate business owners to. Yeah, fly business class uh, for a, for a third of the price um, is 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 almost the the goal. And why would know, I sign up? I think you should, Carl. I'll, uh, I'll I'll get one of the the team to to talk with you. I think you make a great customer. Bro, I've got seventy thousand on my credit cards right now that he's paying off. ANZ well, and ANZ and, and, and Amex. I I got the platinum Amex specifically for the points because we're. I, I wasn't, you know, we're spending a lot of money on stuff, like you just said, and we're not claiming. I'm getting these one point here and one point there, and it's peanuts. I think I spent <laughs> half a million dollars last year on this card, and I, and I think I got two hundred thousand points, which is like, yeah, that's that's yeah. tragic. I, th I think you might need some uh, assistance with that. So, you know, what our team does is. A helps you generate the most amount of points with your expenses, but then B also helps you with redeeming those points. So, you know, yes, you can use your Amex for a whole multitude of 
um, you know, airlines, but we also have our internal proprietary points um, system, which is called Pay Rewards. And that has complete flexibility of you can redeem points for business invoices. You can redeem them um, for, you know, pretty much anything. Uh, and it's hugely revolutionary. And um, yeah, you should uh, should check it out because um, yeah, it's, it's it's. Who's a great girl that works with you? Irene. Irene Stefani. Yes. Is she still there? Yeah, Irene says she's in uh she's in Manila. She's got the thriller in Manila at the moment, training some of our uh training some of our new staff. Oh, I think she tried to she tried to get me to understand it, and I'm just stupid and I just couldn't understand it. And she was explaining it in so simple ways, and I was like, Oh, it's too hard. So maybe get her to re reach back out and let's see if we can get, get that going. Oh, I'm glad I'll be glad to become a customer and and get rid of the ANZ or the the, comp or the American Express cards. Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, look. Ultimately, uh, everyone predominantly uses you know American Express and earns the points because you know they like transferring them out to the let's say Qantas uh, reward, or Qantas frequent flyer, or they use it for Qatar, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, but what our platform does is allow them to hey, I'm. I'm limited on earning with my American Express to the, you know, the payments that accept, uh, you know, the merchants that accept the American Express card. Whereas what we do is we open the, we, we, this Pandora's box, it just explodes. And we can three, four, five times the amount of um, points that you, you can earn. And therefore, hey, that trip to the UK that you're going back to see your son, um, hey, guess what? Carl's flying uh, through the Qatar privilege privilege club flying business class he's, he's flying flat as a, a chap called steve huey you should follow on linkedin it sounds like australia has like become this hub for pretty fintechs i mean you know, nick molnar and his his afterpay stuff you know nick did a video for us and we did we, we, we kick-started the starlight campaign with a video with nick and i'm all in on lucy Lou's business with air wallets so I've mm. I've kicked I've kicked the banks into touch because they just they've lost touch. So I'm now everything is done through Air Wallets um, with Lucy's business and it, it just works. It's like I pay everything through that. I, I, I had to get a couple of credit cards because you need them for for, for business uh, because if you, especially if you want the points. And so I just got what I could because I'm 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 a bit of a difficult child and I do yeah you know, my life's not been very simple at all and. And, and getting access to a sim, getting access to a credit card was a complete nightmare because of my background is I, I don't have a good credit rating and all that sort of shit. I had to call execs over at Equifax to ask to tell them to tell me why I was getting the, what, what what needs to be cleared. And so I, I I found out what my issues were, and then I was able to get rid of them. And just this is the start. The journey of a startup is a crazy one because you. You don't pay a bill, you get blacklisted, you can't get a card, then all of a sudden this happens, and it why well it, it's a good point because that's actually the problem that um you know pay.com.au has solved in that it's not just credit card payments, you can pay bank account uh yeah. transfers and earn points on those transactions. And therefore, yeah. actually, those uh you know businesses that are either you know struggling to get a credit card or don't want to go through the whole process or just don't want that debt sitting on their balance sheet they um they come to us and they you know pay payroll they pay all their bank uh, transfers and um yeah ultimately it gets them to the to the place that they want to get to quite quite literally so how many points do i need to get a business class flight to the uk oh look it varies by airline but um if you, you have first rule is is you need um to spend some time and have you know book it let's say six or 12 months in advance it depends what airline yeah. Qantas is notoriously difficult to find the reward seats. Now, the reward seats are the ones where they're actually discounted in the points. Is a, it's a reasonable amount of points to get a flight. You don't want to do any of the points, the cash. It just doesn't become um, doesn't become economical. Um, yeah. But if you look at Singapore Airlines, Chris Fly, if you look at Qatar with the um, Privilege Club, in general, to get to the UK, you'll be looking at about 140, 150,000 points one way. Business class. If you yeah. go economy, you can look at significantly less than that. I won't fly that economy, um, mate. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> six foot two. You won't catch no car with the no. I'm six foot two. No way. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, they might need a bigger. You might have to fly first class, car. We might need a bigger, bigger bed. Uh, for I you. That. I've done that a couple of times. I tell you what, it's hard going back to. I did first class on on Etihad 
I actually conned the company that I was working with because it, who was it? It was um, Cable and Wireless uh, Worldwide. I was I was an account director for one of their when they their Australian office, and they, the, the, rule, the, the rule was any more than eight hours flight, you can fly business, but you've got to get the cheapest one. And so I discovered that Etihad were twelve thousand uh, dollars for first class, but Qantas was $13,000 for business class. So I got the corporate travel agent to book the first class and actually write it as business, just change it, change it to business. So I flew, it was cheaper than, it was cheaper than the Qantas business class. So I flew backwards and forwards to the UK three times on, on Etihad. Oh, wow. Let me tell you, as a kid growing up, when you, you fly economy and whatever else, and then you go into first, going back to economy, going back to business after that, impossible well, well the etihad that's uh that's the double bed right that you walk in yeah. as a suite um yeah so yeah and and look um ultimately uh you know with the points what ends up is that you can get those seats for you know it could be a quarter to a third of the price so you're you know twelve thousand dollars you probably would have paid four or five thousand if you had the points and then you pay the taxes and um yeah. it works out significantly cheaper we're on a growth space, and so I think we're going to spend quite a lot of money on our cards over the next over the next year because we're growing. And um, I, I'd love to be able to even just get these points racked up and then team flying business. You know, get the team going over to the UK or whatever they need to. And so it's, it, it should be a great way for us to incentivize the team at, at the same time. So let's let's have a chat afterwards. I better go and get on this. I got a one. I got a one o'clock call with Brian Ferris, and Brian's one of our ambassadors. It's a, it's a podcast like this. Brian's the current chief digital officer. This is a great opportunity. He's the current chief digital officer for loyalty in New Zealand, which is like flybys in Australia. Um, I wonder if there's a conversation with with with, with um, pay.com.au and, and, and loyalty in New Zealand. That could be a really great conversation for you guys. Happy to connect you. Yeah, please. Uh, 100%. I think that would be a... Um... Yeah, really interesting conversation. We're always bringing yeah. on new partners, and um, yeah, let's I'll be uh, be a pleasure to me. And they've got all those small businesses, hundreds of thousands of them, I'd imagine, in there, which would be your target market. So, a great conversation there to have. Um, and he's a Kiwi, and he's a complete, absolute legend. He's, he's launching a book on the fifth of April, so I've, I've got to go and give him a bit of a, a leg up. <laughs> good luck with that carl and hey look thanks so much for the invite i really appreciate it. it's been an honor to chat with you no it's, it's beautiful mate we'll, we'll, we'll cut it up and send it out and do some bits and bobs with it and you know it, it, there's a lot of value in there that you've shared and, and that needs to get out there and i think what you're doing with tea time is completely admirable and it should be global it, if it's not it's a travesty and what you're doing with, with jimmy is it, i'll support that all day long Appreciate appreciate your words, Carl. Thanks so much. Take care.